people good morning great to see all you guys it's uh, beautiful it's cooler weather and uh, for little of April we'll take it but um, this morning we continue in first John we're in chapter 3 um, and John has been um, kind of circling this argument or statement um, over and over and over again. He, he keeps talking about dear children, so he, he's anchoring it in identity. And then he's um, exhorting them um, to, to love. Um, and then he's explaining to them that that can't be manufactured, but it comes from a love relationship from within. Much like he said in his gospel in John 15, that abiding in Christ is what produces the fruit that we can do nothing in and of ourselves. And so he just keeps working this thread over and over and over again. And so I was asking, you know, as I was getting ready to prepare the message, I'm sitting there going, man, I think I've said this already, and I have. And, um, and so has John. And I think there's um, a repetition in scripture is important, right? Um, God is working this message over and over and over again because we need to hear it. Um, on Easter, we, you know, fed over two thousand people, um, and you guys volunteered. Thank you so much for that, by the way. Um, unbelievable! So many people have um, just shared their gratitude and appreciation. But what we said was, this is what love looks like. And we want the world to know around us. We want all the, the neighbors. They, they get such a confusing message with Christianity. It's been so politicized and nationalized. Um, and we want them to know, no, this is what love looks like. This is who the body of Christ is ultimately. Um, don't let a few bad apples or uh, the politicized nationalistic nature um distract from the message of who Jesus is and what his people are like. And so we said, this is what love looks like. And that's what John is talking about today. First John 3, verse 11, he says this, this is the message that you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Boom, there it is, uh, the great commandment, right? Then he says, this is what love doesn't look like, okay? So sometimes part of knowing what to do is knowing what not to do. Right, and so he says, "Do not be like Cain, verse twelve, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did you murder him, or why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that you pass from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death, and anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life." Wow, so he says a lot there. We could bog down on certain things. Um, but the primary takeaway here is, is what John wants you to know is what love is not. And he brings up Cain, um, you know, the first murder in the Bible. Um, but he wants to show you how Cain got there, all right? And he says Cain belonged to the evil one, right? Um, why did he murder him? Because Cain's actions were evil. This is what James says, is that these that sin that ultimately manifests starts in our own desires. It starts in our heart. And his brothers were righteous. Right? So there's this, this attitude of jealousy. There's this attitude of um, contempt. There's this attitude of, of um, covetousness and ultimately disregard. Um and this unreconciled tension going on within you and you're looking at this other individual and saying, I can't believe he has this or he's getting that and I'm not. And so then it stews and stews and stews. It builds and builds and builds. And then ultimately, um, you know, Cain acts out because of his jealousy, because he hasn't, uh, reconciled it in his heart. Um, he doesn't see uh, the good in his brother. He's just mad and jealous that his brother's um, 
offering is being accepted and his was not. And so how do we how do we, you know, apply that to our life? Uh well what John is saying is is that murder ultimately starts somewhere else. It starts in in us. It starts um with jealousy. It starts with um FOMO, oh my gosh, I can't believe um or resentment because you didn't get this and someone got that. It starts when you're on Facebook and you someone makes a statement and you're just like, oh, I can't believe that. I'm 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 ghosting them. Ghosting is the you know the the uh new term of, of saying, Hey, I, I'm cutting someone out of my life. They're no longer um someone I wanna follow. Um, or be friends with and we've all done that right and then we have to ask yourself why and now you know there there's uh, boundaries and healthy relational boundaries and, and things like that but then there's also um, the cutting out of someone because of anger that's unresolved um, contempt jealousy and um, when we don't deal with what's going on in us, um, it leads to this habitual or perpetual state of lovelessness. And so the question um, John is asking is, 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 can someone who's a follower of Jesus um, live like that? We should love one another, right? And so um, the second thing is, he says in, in verse 16, this is how we know what love is, all right? And it's perfect tense, so it's, it's um, the totality of past, present, and future, right? This is how we have known and know and will know um, what love is. Jesus laid down his life for us. In other words, this is what love looks like, right? So what we did on Easter, this is what love looks like. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. All right, and he's, he's using um, agape as his term for love, not eros, erotic love, not storge, familial love, not phileo, brotherly love, but agape, this unconditional, divine, um, covenantal type of loyal love. Because this is how we know what agape is. It's what Christ did for us. And then he goes, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions, all right, so he goes right at it, and he sees his brother in need and has no pity, no compassion on him, how can the love of God be in him? When we see, when we see someone in need, and, and it doesn't move us to compassion. My son and um, his girlfriend came home, and uh, they said, hey, you know, uh, there's a homeless guy on our way home, and we have these leftover tacos. And I rolled down the window, my son says, and he said, I, I, I said, hey, would this be okay? Because sometimes the guys don't want food. They want money. And um, Caroline Connor's uh, girlfriend said, and he got teary. The homeless man got teary in his eyes and he reached out and got the tacos and he said, thank you. And there's just this beautiful picture of what love looks like if you have something. And when he says material possessions, the, the Greek word there is bios. It's, it's, it's um, that pertaining to life, right? If you have something um, that can help someone, um, yes, money, right? But food, um, um you know, cutting the limbs of the of the neighborhood lady or um, whatever it is, then then you should you should give that to them. And if you don't have compassion on them, he says this: How can the love of God be in him? So on Easter, when we we fed these families, it was just the bit, tip of the iceberg because we need twenty mentors. Um, we need twenty mentors so that these families who have come to us for the food and registered, who want help, ongoing help, can be coached not just with food, but 
um, someone who could meet with them twice a month and sit down with them and say, oh, let's go over your finances and let's go over your education plan and let's go over um, what's going on um, w with your health and um, all of these just basic life skills that these families um, who grew up in poverty oftentimes don't receive, um, you come alongside a mentor. We need 20 of those. And so, you know, the word went out and, and we've already got a couple signed up, but we need probably 15 more. And so um, here's the thing. If you have something that you can give a couple of hours a month to sit down with a family and you have all these life skills and you have this knowledge, you have your MBA and you have extra time or, or maybe you can just carve out time. The whole point of it is that compassion wells up in you because you see people in need. Or, or the the immigration crisis where we have you know 1500 teenage boys down at uh, Joy Harry Freeman Coliseum well you hear that story and they don't they're not with their parents and they've just been sent to the US and now they're stuck and it's a crisis we don't know what to do with them our government is failing and yet Catholic charities has provided opportunities to go and volunteer and serve you could go do that this week I'll be part of um, you know a forum where we'll be discussing that issue and how um, we're working with the South Texas Alliance for Orphans and a lot of those kids are going to end up in the in the foster care system and if we have uh, parents who get trained and and um, go into the foster care and get equipped they can then receive and that's what we're doing we're saying hey if, if you can be a foster parent uh, help one of these kids out then get the classes that you need. Show compassion. Don't just go, oh, that's so sad. What can we do about it? Um, do something is what John is saying. He's saying, look, if if you love, this is what love looks like. Um, how could the love be in him if he does not have compassion? And then he goes to the next step. This then is how we know, uh, the, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and truth. All right, now he's, he's, he's bringing it home. Oh, I do have compassion. I feel so awful. He says, don't just love with words, actions, and truth. All right, and so th these, are, these are very direct um, I, I was talking to my son's boss, Dean, and his wife, Bernice. Um, they sometimes attend Grace Point. Uh, they have two little girls, busy, busy, um, you know, 30s, businessman, two small kids, um, super busy. I was talking to him, and he said, hey, thanks for mentioning that th immigration thing down at um, in the Catholic Charities. He says, you know, we go down on Friday nights. Um and we minister at the bus station. And I just thought, you know, I don't know of many guys at that season of their life that are taking their Friday night for them and their wife to go down to the bus station. And I was like, that's what love looks like. Um, it wasn't a grace point thing. It wasn't a, I don't even know how, how but it was in his heart to do, to live out his faith um, in action and um, that's what John says this is what it is this is what it looks like because this then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence this is what it looks like and this is how we can be at rest in the presence of God is that we we love authentically we love with actions not with just mere words, not with our own sentiment. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And this is where I call living in the flow is that, you know, what I have, I prayed, I prayed and I asked and I didn't receive. What he says is, if you receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. 
we're in this in sync because our hearts don't condemn us. We're doing our hearts are in alignment with him. And so that our requests are in alignment with him. Be like, um, hey, dad, would it be all right if I took out the, the garbage? Sure. That request is in alignment with my heart. Um, versus, you know, you know, hey, dad, can I drink all the liquor in the liquor cabinet? Um, one thing is something that someone wants that's outside the desire of the Father. One thing is in keeping with the desire of the Father. And he says, when we ask in this way, um, we receive anything we ask. And then he refrains it by saying, and this is his command. All right, this is how you know it's in keeping with the Father. That we... Um, believe in Jesus and that we love one another those who obey his commands live in him and he in them this is how we know that he lives in us we know it by the spirit he gave us comes back to this objective relationship with God by way of the Holy Spirit and um, the heart of love ask and receives because it's in concert with the Holy Spirit. How do we know? Um, well, we know by the Word of God, but we also know by uh, the Holy Spirit. Um, when we're in right relationship with God, and we're, we have a, an understanding of who God is by way of the Holy Spirit, then um, our hearts don't condemn us. We know we're not deceiving ourselves. We know that this is in keeping with God. So what we've been saying, we call it the five R's. First, you receive, right? You receive truth. You hear a sermon, you hear a song, you read a passage of scripture. Or maybe the Holy Spirit impresses upon you and you, you're like, okay. And then you reflect on that. And you're like, is this in keeping with God's word? Right? And we have to be careful because we can twist and turn the word and malign it um, if we're not well motivated. Is this in keeping with... Um, what other believers are speaking into my life. So we, we receive it, then we reflect, all right? And then record, write it down. This is what I believe God said. This is what I believe God heard. I heard from the Lord, from the Spirit, nudged me, all right? And I've bounced it off some other people, and I've thought about it, reflected on it. So I believe, record, I believe this is what the Holy Spirit of God is saying to me. And then convey that to someone, or the next R, relate. So we got, you receive, you hear the truth, you reflect on it to make sure you're discerning the spirits, make sure this is, yeah, this is not crazy stuff. Um, then you write it down, and then you tell someone about it. Because, you know, when you tell someone about it, it makes it real, right? Like, um, we're, my discipleship group, uh, my reflection time after um, encountering the truth, I um, ultimately said, I think God wants me to memorize this passage of scripture um, because this is, this, is, this is an area where I struggle. And so um, I was reflecting on it. I wrote that down and then I had to relate it. I had to tell the guys in my group um, this is what God is saying. And so now there's skin in the game. Now there's some accountability. Now there's relationship, right? And then the final R is respond. Um, now go memorize that passage. Go do what it is that God told you to do. So in the, in the hearing of this message, maybe you're talking about, well, man, I should be uh, a mentor. One of the other things coming up is um, in this 78240, these apartments, we want um, apartment captains to build teams to go in once or twice a month and just, whether it's canvassing for VBS, whether it's doing a VBS at this apartment complex, whether it's having a Bible study, whether it's just um, giving away tacos or helping people get signed up for um, Hill Country Daily Bread or um, just prayer walking in an apartment complex. Just be the man of peace in that apartment complex. We need 20 of those by 2022. 
And so, you know, when, when these things come out, these concrete things that I'm talking about, whether it's being a mentor or whether it's being an apartment uh, captain, um, whatever, signing up for life group, doing whatever, whatever it is that the Holy Spirit prompts you to do, filter it through that. So, Because here's the thing. You might hear this and go, oh, man, I really ought to do that out of obligation. And I, I, that's not who I'm talking to. Because if it's not prompted and motivated by love, right, then it's lifeless. And, and so here's – think about this, all right? Um, Jim Wilder, uh, he's a neuroscientist and Christian. He's saying one of the big problems that we've done is we've made discipleship all uh, left brain. In other words, it's rational, it's logical, it's analytical. So when we hear – if you love me, you will keep my commands. We think, well, I'm going to go out and <clears throat> keep some commands and show God that I love him. And he's saying, no, 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 no. You've got to engage the right brain. And this is what John says and has been saying, both in his gospel and in his epistles. He's saying, no, when we're in love with God, obedience flows out of us. It's our will and desire to do those things. And so if you hear something like, uh, we need 20 mentors, or we need uh, 20 apartment captains, um, and it wells up within your heart, you're like, oh, that's what I want to do. Yes, yes, that's what the church should be about. Yes. Then respond out of that love. Respond out of what the Holy Spirit is saying. Yes, yes, yes to. Not, oh, well, I guess I should. Now, count the cost, right? Um Yes, yes, yes. Okay. How am I going to make time? How am I going to orient my life toward that? How am I? Um, but if that's something that interests you, just text 484848. Yes. Right? Because we'll come alongside you and we'll help you fulfill what God is cultivating um, by way of his spirit in you. Now, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to be in right relationship with God in this concert with God, in the flow of life with God. And so he's saying, dear children, he's talking about identity. Uh, dear children, love. And they're good people. They're loving people. But without the Holy Spirit of God, they can't agape love. They can be kind. They can be sentimental. They can be generous. Um they want to be right, do the right thing, good, high character people. But they can't be in this flow with the Holy Spirit because they don't possess the Spirit. And what Scripture says is if you have the Holy Spirit of God in you, you know it. You, you just know it, right? And so someone sitting out there was like, man, I've been a Christian since I was six. and um, But I, I don't think of it that way. I don't I know for sure the Holy Spirit. Well... I would question, A, you either never really surrendered your life, your identity to Jesus and received his identity and, and spirit, or you so early on quenched the Holy Spirit of God and just have chosen and le didn't learn how to follow and be a disciple, didn't learn how to cultivate that, that there's a silenced uh, person in your life. Maybe you ghosted the Holy Spirit. So, um, ask so okay that's truth right so receive the truth reflect on it what does that mean did I I think I did what do I need to do you know what's God saying or if he's not if you're not hearing that what scripture says very clearly is to believe in the name of the son of the Lord Jesus Christ and surrender to exchange my life for your life and if you want to exchange your life right now Receive the Holy Spirit. Then text 484848 exchange. I want to encourage you to do that. If you've listened this far, if you've stayed with me this far, one of the most powerful things you can do is click the share button. When people share, it's amazing what God is doing through just um, sharing the good news of the gospel. And so whether you need to receive the Holy Spirit or whether the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you and you need to put faith in action, Quit just being a hearer of the word. Quit just being a compassionate, empathetic, um, uh, uh, where it's you and Jesus and no one else. Where the private, intimate relationship you owe Jesus never makes it into 
the form of action. The work uh, is what it's translated. The, the word uh, in Greek is ergon. Put your faith in action. And it's, it's work. Get busy. Get busy living out the life of Christ. What does it look like? It looks like laying down your life. And so in order to do these things, in order to be a mentor, in order to be an apartment captain, in order to lead a life group, in order to, you have to lay down your life. You have to lay down um, watching that extra show on Netflix, or you have to lay down this extraneous hobby. If you have to lay down the extra day at the gym, you have to lay, you have to lay some stuff down. And Jesus says, you, you're going to lay down your life. And that's what love looks like. It looks like surrender. Well, thanks for being with us this morning. I hope this message finds you well. And um, again, share it. And if we can come alongside you and pray for you or encourage you in any way, let us know. God bless you. See you next week.